Well, hello, how are you doing? Nick here, M0NTV, and welcome back to my shack and to another video. Uh, sorry, I've not been posting for a while, but hey, you know, life gets in the way, doesn't it? Um, but I'm back, and uh, thanks for joining me. And I'm about to start another series. Uh, well, it's the same series, really, but a um, different bit of the series um, on the transmit chain of this 17 meter SSB transceiver that I'm building. Uh, we've pretty much done the uh, uh, the receive chain now, and I've shown that working. So we're going to turn the attention to the transmit side. And uh, now some of that, obviously, because it's a transceiver, I mean the mixers do both, so I'm not going to go over the mixers again, um, particularly. Um, but obviously there will be some special parts that are unique to the uh, to the transmitter. Um, so we're going to look at the front end from the the microphone through to the um, uh, the mic amplifier, um, and then the back end um, where the magic really starts to happen uh, with the, the small signal transmit amplifiers and the drivers and the, finally the PA. Um, so yeah, that's all coming um, uh, in the next uh, few weeks. But before then, before we kind of launch into all that, I just want to kind of take a moment and um, just kind of share uh, uh, just a few thoughts. So this is going to be a different kind of video, really. So I'm not going to tell you necessarily how to build something today. So if you just want that, then, you know, <laughs> wait for the next one. Um, but what I want to do today is just kind of share some thoughts about when you get to that stage, like I have just been with the uh, receive chain of, of, of connecting it all together. And, and because I'm a great proponent of this modular style of, of building um, so and I show you videos uh, with things um, like this okay so this is my IF amplifier and I did a, a video about um, building this and um, and most of my videos are that kind of format you know we'll, we'll take a little block a little bit of the radio and uh, and I'll show you how I built it and and, and find faults in it <laughs> and get it working and then test it uh, and, and tweak it perhaps and get it um, so that I'm happy with it. And that's fine. Um, and uh, and then the next video, I've moved on to another module and i you know tell you about that. But there comes the time when you have to, you know, plug all these things uh, together and turn that into this. <laughs> now, and connect all this stuff up. And at some stage, you probably want to go a bit further and uh, turn that big rat's nest of, of uh, RF cables uh, and, and scattered boards into something you can shoehorn into an enclosure and make it look a bit more uh, presentable. But I usually would build transceivers um, like this. Now, logic would kind of dictate that, you know, if you've built a module and you've got it working and you've tested it and you've tweaked it and, you, and you're happy with it right and you've moved on you've put it aside then you built another module and you've done the same stuff with that when it comes to linking all these modules together why wouldn't it work first time because you've tested them all individually um, and it can be a bit um, frustrating uh, when it often doesn't and you realize actually that a radio is more than the sum of the individual parts and what I mean is, uh, the, the issue is actually quite simple, really. It's just when you when you build all these separate modules and you'll test them, um, but when you join them all together, uh, actually the, the test conditions are, are different. Um, so uh, the, the signal that you're testing with uh, is going through different stages, so it will, it will look different it might be more powerful or, or, or more attenuated it might be you know uh, have harmonics that it didn't have before it, it, it could be any number of things so you're not comparing apples with apples so when you 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 put it all together um, it's like you're testing it for the first time in a sense uh, with all these different bits um, and really what I want to uh, just offer it I suppose what um, Pete Giuliano and, um, and Bill Mira would call a bit of tribal um, knowledge here, um, just the voice of experience really of, <laughs> of being frustrated by this process. Um, my three top tips, right, my three top tips for connecting it all together and getting it to work. Um, and um, it's surprising really 
how many issues can be uh, fixed by, uh, or helped at least, by, by some of these things that I'm going to um, suggest. So, um, yeah, we will crack on and, uh, and, and hope you find this useful. So, connecting it all together and then getting it to work. What do you do when you connect it all together and it doesn't work? Well, here are my three top tips. And there's nothing uh, unique or original about these, um, certainly not to me, they're, they're just uh, things that I've gleaned uh, and, and learned from others um, that have helped me when I've been faced with these uh, challenges of, uh, uh, of trying to get uh, my radio to work uh, as I think it ought to, um, uh, but it doesn't appear to be. So, uh, and I've put these in reverse order, so we're going to go three, two, one. It's not that necessarily one is more important than the other, but I found that they kind of are, but that's possibly just the way that um, I, I do things. And you could consider these to be almost like tools, really, that we have at our disposal. Um, not physical tools like soldering irons and screwdrivers, but, but tools nevertheless. So, um, uh, number three, impedance matching. Well, the first question to ask, I suppose, is why bother? I mean, what difference does it make? Well, quite a bit, actually. Um, now, most hams, the only bit of impedance matching they're usually thinking about is the output of their transceiver to their antenna. And, um, and so we're familiar with um, VSWI, you know, and... Um, uh, and we know the importance of getting a good 50 ohms match. Well, actually, that same principle is true not just from the output of your transceiver to your antenna, but the whole of the way through your transceiver as well. Um, and I'll show you why. So what you're seeing here is an LT Spice simulation. Um, and if you're not familiar with LT Spice, it, I would really advise that you um, that you get familiar with it. It's it's incredibly powerful uh, electronics uh, simulator. It's free, uh, and there's um, a, a lot of resources out there on the internet to help you to uh, understand it and to use it, and lots of user groups. And uh, yeah, it's uh, very good. Um, so what we're seeing on the left here um, is a very very simple little circuit. So uh, we we've got um, uh, seven megahertz sine wave 100 volts peak so 200 volts peak to peak so you know a big <laughs> big signal with a 50 ohms uh, internal impedance so that's that's the characteristic impedance of that signal uh, i've just shown it as a separate resistor but it's that's actually all part of it. so you could imagine this is um, uh, one module, if you like, uh, this uh, uh, sine wave generator and this resistor so that's the characteristic uh, resistance is 50 um, ohms the impedance and that's going into your load now the load what we're going to do we're going to step the load up um, in 10 ohm increments from 1 ohm to 200 ohms and so if we look at the right hand side now on this graph so on the x-axis here on the bottom this is impedance going from 1 ohm right up to 200 ohms and on the y-axis here um, this is the power out in watts and so what we are seeing then is is what happens if you vary the amount of resistance in the load so the characteristic impedance is at 50 ohms but we're checking out what's it look like if you don't match the impedance if you give it something else wildly different uh, and, and see what difference that makes to the power coming out. And it's pretty clear to see here, um, this green line is the power out. So if you look at the peak, if I put my cursor on it, you can just about uh, see it. We're up here and lo and behold, look at that, 50 ohms, right? Okay, 50 ohms. And so the maximum power transfer occurs when the the load is 50 ohms when the characteristic impedance is 50 ohms in other words when the impedances are matched that's when you get most um, 
And when you go away from that, certainly when you go underneath that, it really starts to, uh, to pull away. Uh, if your impedance is, is a lot less than that on the load, uh, and, and less so um, if the impedance is higher than that, but it still curves away uh, nonetheless. Now, the blue uh, line is the SWR, and again, it won't be a surprise to any of you, I'm sure, to see that if I put my mouse down the lowest point of the SWR, uh, corresponds to... Uh, the uh, around about 50 ohms so uh, yes so that uh, that would make sense what's also interesting to note of course is that actually even at its height with a hundred ohms peak with a 50 ohms characteristic impedance going into a 50 ohms load the most power you will get out is 25 watts and that's just because your 100 volts is being shared because the, the characteristic impedance of your, your signal generator it looks like a, a 50 ohms resistor. That voltage is being shared with your load. So you've actually got a voltage divider. So you've got 50 volts being dropped here, which you don't see, and 50 volts being dropped there. So it halves. So the voltage is halved, but actually the power... Uh, is only a quarter because 100 volts peak over 50 ohms would give you 100 watts but actually because that's it's shared with your load and you've got to have a load <laughs> of course um, but actually although the voltage is halved the power uh, is is reduced by a factor of four so you only get the best you're going to get is 25 watts um, out at, and that's just <laughs> physics and how it works. Interesting. So that's why you want to try and match your impedances uh, as much as possible. And I suppose the only other kind of takeaway from this would be when you're matching impedances, it would be better to have a load that was too high rather than too low. And I think that's fairly clear because if your your load impedance is much lower than the the source impedance then the power really tails off quite sharply. Whereas it's less so if it's a bit higher. So it's better to have, you know, if <laughs> if you're not going to match it very well, it's better to have a, a bit too much and a bit too less, I think, is the, uh, is the takeaway from this. Uh, but that's the importance of impedance matching. Now, I should say, the reason why you get that disparity with the voltage being halved, but the, the uh, power uh, being quartered is because, of course, the way power is calculated. So um, uh, power is the voltage squared over the resistance, which is why you get that. Now, what do you do about this? How do you match uh, impedance? Well, there's different ways of doing it. My preferred method is to use the so-called lossless method of impedance matching. I say so-called because in the real world, there's no such thing as lossless. Um, anything really <laughs> um, but uh, yes so that's to use uh, a transformer um, and I'm not going to go into all that now because I've already covered this uh, particularly in my video crystal filters for the fearful which I will link to below towards the end of that video I go into precisely how I do that the easiest thing to do is to build every module with the input and output impedance as 50 ohms. Now for some things like um, bandpass filters, uh, if you can see that there, um, that's fine because you design them that way and they're, they're 50 ohms in and out, that's great. So you can pull one out of the, of the drawer when you're prototyping and you know it's 50 ohms in and out. Um, for, for things like this, uh, this is uh, a, a a crystal filter um, so that's not quite so simple because that doesn't have uh, uh, an impedance that is 50 ohms in and out but you'll see that I've included those um, transformers there so they do that impedance matching so I've already done that work I've done that calculation and put those matching transformers in so when I pull this out the drawer and, and connect it in, I don't have to think about it and think, oh, what was that again? Because I've already done that work. So, so 
I know I've got 50 in and out. Um, and the same for uh, even active uh, electronics. So this is uh, a product detector. This is uh, an active product detector using uh, an NE602 uh, uh, double mounts uh, Gilbert cell uh, chip. Um, and that has a characteristic input impedance of 1,500 ohms. So again, you can probably just see over here, I've built a little matching uh, transformer uh, that does that and uh, matches then the 50 ohms, which is coming uh, in and out here. So, um, uh, so yeah, if you can do that work on the module, that's far, far easier, particularly if you're going to do like I do and, and build some of these things just to have around uh, in the shack, in the workshop, so you can put things together. It just saves a lot of complication um, because you, you know you've already done that work, you've done that calculation, so it's going to have 50 ohms in and out. So that's the easiest way uh, to do it. As I say, check out that um, video, um, Crystal Filters for the Fearful, if you want to know how to do um, uh, the maths. There's a little bit of maths, it's not too hard. It can't be too hard because I do it. <laughs> right? Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so that's uh, number three, that is impedance matching. Uh, let's have a look then at uh, my my uh, top tip for, for uh, stringing it together and getting it to work. Um, uh, and let's look at number two. Well, number two is filtering. Well, I mean, <laughs> what can I say about filtering that I haven't already said many times before? I think I've probably produced more videos about filtering than about anything else. Um, so by all means, check out my back catalogue of uh, video um, uh, videos about filtering if you want to find out how to build an RF filter. Um, so, but why would you why would you need more filtering? Well, I think when I first started out building radios. Um, I kind of thought, well, you know, you need a bandpass filter at the front end. Um, if it's a super het, you're going to need some kind of narrow sideband filter, a crystal filter in the IF stage. Um, and, of course, if it's a transceiver, and transmitter, um, you're going to need a, a low-pass filter, at least on the end um, of the, um, the PA, and maybe another bandpass filter in there. Um, but the fact is, you know, you can put filters anywhere you want. Um, the last rig I built, um, uh, the uh, the optimizer, has more filtering in it than any radio I've produced, and it's hands down the best radio I've ever built. You know, it gets uh, consistently good reports on the audio and the modulation. I'm convinced uh, it's because it's it's I filtered it all the way through, so um, it's. It's not a question of, you know, if you've got some harmonics, you think, oh, well, never mind, you know, I'll just filter all of them out at the end. Because by the time they get through those other stages, they've produced more harmonics and more problems. So if you can kind of kind of nip issues in the bud as you go along, that's, I think, quite a helpful thing, even if it means you have to build more filters. And, um, and they can be simple um, uh, uh, filters, just a simple low-pass filter at some stage can, can be helpful. The other thing is, is if you're building, uh, I mean, obviously after mixers, that's that's really important because you know when you're mixing by the nature of non-linear nature of mixing, you're going to get all these other products that you don't want. But even things like harmonics, so when you're building amplifiers, if you're putting perhaps a bit more signal through your amplifier than you than you thought you were going to be when you built it originally and tested it, you might find you've got some harmonics. Um, now, what you could do is not put as much signal through the amplifier so you wouldn't get the harmonics. Hold that thought. Um, but if you really need that level, <clears throat> of course, what you can do is simply filter those harmonics out at, at, at the, the output of, uh, of that amplifier. So, um, yeah, so filtering is, is a, just a great thing. Uh, it's another kind of bread and butter thing of, of radio building. And um, and if you can get into the habit of kind of thinking about doing that, perhaps you know not just at the beginning and the end, but but as you go along, where it's needed, obviously, um, 
then uh, yeah, that's I think that's another good kind of a tool in in the toolbox really of, uh, of the radio constructor. So I'm not going to say any more about that because as I said, I've said plenty about filters um, uh, in the past. Um, so let's crack on with the third uh, and final one, uh, my uh, number one uh, top tip for stringing it all together and getting it to work. And so here it is, my number one top tip for connecting it all together and getting it to work is attenuation. Now I know what some of you are thinking, is that it? <laughs> attenuation? It's hardly going to set the world on fire. I feel a little bit underwhelmed at this point, and that is precisely why this is my number one. Because this flies under the radar a bit. It's a bit counterintuitive, at least it was um, for me, um, because particularly when I first started out, you know, if I was going to build an amplifier, I would, you know, tune it for maximum smoke, <laughs> literally in some cases. Um, and, you know, so I'd want as much gain out of this thing as, as possible. Um, but I quickly learned that, that actually having too much gain is, is worse very often than having not enough gain. Um, and I kind of got into this mindset of, of, of just balancing the strengths of signals throughout the, uh, uh, the signal chain in your, in your radio. So, so yeah, sure, amplify that signal, but um, but maybe take it down a bit. Um, and what I can say is that of all the issues that I've had, and I think probably and this is the fifth SSB transceiver that I've scratch built. I think in every one of them, I've had issues when I put it all together like this. Um, and I think in just about every case, the the single most effective solution to getting that radio working was attenuation. That's how important it is, and that's why it's my number one. Um, but it's not necessarily immediately obvious because, uh, as I said before, you know you can build an amplifier and, and test it, and it works great. Um, but but once you've got it all connected up together, it, the, they're different test conditions, and the the issue then is if you're feeding your amplifier with, uh, with a, a larger signal, and so that's resulting in a larger signal in the output of the amplifier, there is a danger you can overdrive the next stage. Um, so if you're overdriving your amplifier, you can get harmonics, so you, you've now got a whole, whole bunch of other um, signals that you weren't bargaining on. Um, and also, if you depending on what your next stage is as well, um, you can get all kinds of, uh, of issues. I mean, on this, this 17 uh, metre rig that I was building, I had a really weird issue um, where, um, I, well, what was actually happening is I was overdriving the, the, one of the IF amps, uh, and actually it was, it was oscillating, um, and it ended up um, reflecting signal back into the mixer, um, so that signal going back into the mixer, mixed with all the other signals that were there as well, produced some new signals. And, and, and what it ended up happening being is when, when you tuned across the band, you were hearing signals twice. <laughs> once where they actually were, and once because they were mixing with other signals being reflected back. And, going, and you were hearing them in a different part of the band, over the top of whatever else should have been there. You know, So it was a right old mess. And actually, the cure for that was a bit of attenuation. Right? So, I, so I wasn't overdriving that IF amplifier. Um, and the IF amps are, are a case in point, actually, because you, 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 you're, you're focused on trying to take a tiny signal and make it a bit bigger. And it kind of, as I said, is counterintuitive to think, well, actually, I'm going to attenuate it now. I think, what am I, I don't want to make it smaller, I want to make it bigger. But actually, Sometimes you, 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 you amplify it, then you take it down a bit into the next one. Then you amplify it, then you might take it down a bit more. And, and I'll tell you exactly how I work out how much attenuation to, 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 uh, to, to put in uh, and how to, to do that in just a moment. Uh, but just to say, I, I can't stress enough you know, how, how much of an eye-opener this, this business of attenuation has, has, has been uh, to me. Um, and so it's, it's really worth thinking. And sometimes it can, whether your um, uh, radio works or not, can turn on literally one or two dB. 
You know, if you've just got just a tiny bit too much can be enough. And one of the other issues I had, again, with the IF stack is when I got all the amplifier, the, the separate IF um, stages together, so the crystal filter and the, the different IF amps, and, and they were working, right? And I got them all together as a stack, all together, closely uh, together. Well, they weren't amplifying, they were oscillating. <laughs> You know, so so a very effective oscillator actually, but I didn't want it to be an oscillator. I wanted it to be an amplifier, um, uh, and so again, but the, the cure for that again was a little bit of attenuation on the input into it. So I wasn't overdriving um, those those amplifiers. How do I even determine how many notches to take it down? Um, here's how. Right. So let's say you've got an amplifier. And you've determined that uh, there's too much power coming out of that amplifier. So you need to attenuate your signal down and, uh, and knock it down a few dBs. How do you work that out? Well, uh, what I do um, is I got myself a little set of these um, Neuralec little attenuators. So, in the art, I'll just take the uh, top off. So, they're the little SMA attenuators. And uh, I've got a set of them. They weren't all that expensive. Um, so, um, I've got a 20 dB, a 10, uh, a 6, a 3, a 2, and a 1. So, that will give you, by different combinations of those, and you can stack them you know, in series, um, any attenuation level between 1 dB and 42 dB, which is great. So really, it's it's a question of trial and error. So you think, well, okay, well, let's try 10 dB. So you put the 10 dB on, connect it all in together, and, and see if that fixes your problem. See whether you're still overdriving the next stage and you're still getting the issues, whatever. Um, if it has fixed, if it's not fixed the problem, um, maybe you need to up the, uh, 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 the the amount of attenuation. If it has fixed the problem, maybe you think, okay, well, do I need quite as much as 10 dB? Let's try, you know, um, 8 dB or so, and then, and then work it down again until the problem reoccurs. So then you know the threshold uh, that you've got, and you might want to put a bit of extra kind of uh, margin in there uh, uh, as well. But you can work that out then. And it's as simple as just joining these things together. Now, there are other variable attenuators and, and, and different things that people have. Uh, but I find these things quite handy. I use them all the time. In fact, I haven't got the 10 dB one here at the minute, mainly because it's being used for precisely this purpose uh, in, in, the, in the radio um, behind me, uh, messing around with something else. So, um, yeah, so that's how you do it. So, so let's say you, you work out that... The sweet spot is 6 dB. You need to take your signal down by 6 dB. What do you do then? Well, my personal favourite is to build a Pi attenuator. Um, and uh, so essentially, this is can be as simple as three resistors. So it's two identical resistors. Well, they're identical if if you've got the same output and input impedance. You can do some impedance matching with the Pi attenuators as well, but we'll leave that for now. But let's say we're going for 50 ohms to 50 ohms. Um, you've got two identical shunt resistors to ground, and then you've got a series resistor, which is a different value, which connects those two. So it could be as simple as three resistors, which actually, when you think about it, is quite easy physically to accommodate You know, in your... Uh, in your module. So if you've got, I don't know, let's say a BNC socket for your output, which I often have, you just need to disconnect the feed to that and, and put the Pi attenuator in and, uh, and and then do it that way. Um, so, all right, let's build a Pi attenuator. How do we do that? Well, my personal favourite um, is is this website here. So this is Kamandi, Kamandi.com um, and uh, it's a brilliant website, actually. There's uh, lots of uh, calculators that uh, that you can use for, for different things um, and uh, this is the one for the matching pi attenuator calculator there is another one for just a standard pi attenuator but um, and we're not really doing any matching but I'll, I'll I just generally use this one if you're interested in how it works they do include all the maths down here but you don't need to bother about that uh, if, if you're not um, so we just fill it in so let's say then we're going to work 
have a 50 ohms input impedance um, and one of the 50 ohms output impedance and we're going to do 6 dBs. Um, now down here we want to tick this mismatch losses uh, and there's a note at the bottom that explains but if you're doing uh, anything for RF they suggest you tick that if you're doing it for audio they suggest you don't tick it um, but obviously we're at RF level so yeah 50 ohms in 50 ohms out 6 dB attenuation mismatch losses and um, uh, hit the calculate and so it tells us now so we've got the shunt in the shunt out and the series so uh, for the shunt in and the shunt out, it's giving us those values, 150.476 ohms, and the ideal series resistor is 37.352. Now, that's great. Obviously, these are ideal values. You're highly unlikely to be able to <laughs> go to the junk box and find uh, values, components of this uh, value. Um, so down here, you can play around with them a bit. So what I try and do is uh, I would try and get two uh, the, the shunt resistors as close as possible. So if I can get them the same, that's fine. But let's say I've got two and they're 149 ohms, say. Um, so I'll just change those. So just for the moment, 149 ohms. We'll hit calculate again. We'll keep that for the same the, the series one for a minute. And you can see what it's doing here. Uh, the output, the input impedance, the output impedance, the uh, the SWR in and out, reflection coefficient, um, return loss, etc. So it's really brilliant. So you can see the differences you make. And let's say we've got I don't know uh, thirty nine ohm resistor, thirty nine ohms. Calculate and look one point naught one. So you know that's certainly close enough and you're getting just over 6 dB. So what you can do is you can put the actual values if you've got a good multimeter, uh, measure those uh, resistors as, as uh, carefully as you can and put them in there and you can see if you need to go up one or down one a bit just to get the right kind of um, SWR and the right uh, amount that you're happy with. Um, and then you just build it. So and it's, it is as simple as that. So you know it's the input here so you basically just have a series resistance uh, for it. So this would be the kind of the 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 output from your amp, and this perhaps be the 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 BNC connector of, of the output. So you insert that resistor in there, and uh, at the input and the output, you you just uh, put your shunt ones down to ground. So uh, yeah, I use it all the time. Really, really useful. And uh, and there it is. So that's um, that's how to build um, uh, some attenuation into your signal chain. So there we go, and uh, apologies, it's a bit of a long one this time, um, and if it didn't float your boat this time, then no worries, um, but I do hope, uh, at least for some folks, uh, that will give you some help um, when it comes to the business of connecting it all together and getting it to work. So thanks ever so much for watching, and I'll catch it on the next video. Bye-bye.